see, I had a problem. Santa Claus never brought any hands in my, you know, my stocking. You know, he, you know, Santa, Santa brought his, his hands. So. Welcome back to the Athletes Podcast. This is the 240th episode of the show. We're here to educate, entertain, and inspire the next generation of athletes. Thanks for joining the show. Today, we're powered by Perfect Sports Supplements. If you haven't heard of them, they have the number one protein in Canada. My favorite flavor, Canadian maple, because we're all Canucks. We have national pride. Today, we feature Canuck on the show. His name is Brent Sopel. If you haven't heard of him, he was selected 144th overall at the 1995 NHL entry draft by the Vancouver Canucks, my hometown team, hence why we're repping the jersey. He also played for the New York Islanders, the Los Angeles Kings, the Chicago Blackhawks, the Atlanta Thrashers, the Montreal Canadiens, most notably winning a Stanley Cup in 2010. Now, fast forward after that hockey career is over, after his daughter was diagnosed with dyslexia, Sobel was also diagnosed with a learning disability after the symptoms that he was suffering from sounded similar to what his daughter was going through. So this inspired him to create the Brent Sobel Foundation, which ultimately aims to help promote and raise funds for youth with dyslexia. Brent is an inspiration to me and so many others, having grown up, watched him on the ice as I was a young buck here playing the sport of hockey. It was amazing to be in the dressing room with Brendan Morrison, Marcus Naslin, Todd Bertuzzi, and one of the things that, fortunately enough, with this podcast that we're able to do is now impact people positively, spread the word about what people are doing, use this as an incredible platform. And it only happens thanks to you folks who are listening, sharing these episodes and bringing forward amazing guests that we feature on a weekly basis. So thank you for that. And without further ado, you folks know I'll be participating in the Toronto Marathon here in just over five weeks. One of the aspects that I wanted to integrate is some charitable part. And because of this, I want to raise funds for the Brent Sobel Foundation so that more folks who are suffering from ADHD, dyslexia, among other learning disabilities, get the support that they deserve. So I'll link the links to donate down below. I appreciate you for tuning in. I appreciate Brent for jumping on the show. And I can't wait for you folks to let me know what you think, because it's an amazing episode. Thanks for tuning in the 240th episode of the Athletes Podcast. Here we go. You're the most decorated racquetball player in U.S. history. World's strongest man. From childhood passion to professional athlete. Eight-time Ironman champion. So what was it like making your debut in the NHL? What is your biggest piece of advice for the next generation of athletes? From underdogs to national champions. This is the Athletes Podcast, where high-performance individuals share their triumphs, defeats, and life lessons to educate, entertain, and inspire the next generation of athletes. Here we go. My set of notes, questions uh, that I, I get to rip through, but the fun part is that we just get to chat, chop yeah. it up like we were okay. before. And uh, I get to learn a bit more about Brent Sopel, peel back the layers of the onion of the former Ooh, Vancouver you started using my lines now, eh? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know, you got you to do your research. I, uh, you know, the former, the Hab, the Chicago Blackhawk, who won a Stanley Cup in 2010, uh, who I grew up watching the West Coast Express as a kid, Vancouver, like I talked about, White Rock, South Surrey. So an honor to feature you on the show, Brent. I'm um, excited to learn a bit more about what you're doing now post-career, how you've been able to become an advocate for those who are suffering from ADHD, dyslexia, and more so just having a conversation around it, honestly, because you were able to have a 700-plus career NHL game uh, freaking incredible really what you were able to overcome i i was actually speechless watching that documentary uh earlier this morning and i'm doing a decent job introducing what some would call is a warrior on the ice someone who ate pucks for a living and was able to basically do whatever it took um how do you like to start these conversations because you've been asked a million questions you've been on a ton of podcasts i wanted to start with some facts that you were that were shared during that documentary yeah, the fact too. that 30 percent of self-made millionaires are dyslexic 50 percent uh, of people who work at 40. nasa it's is 40, it now 40 30 to 40 yeah 30 to 40 okay see now i'm learning you're going to correct me here the next one mind-boggling 50 percent of people who work at nasa are dyslexic and then 50 percent of people in the world in prison are dyslexic so when you see stats like that and you go undiagnosed for the first almost four decades of your life. How does that make you feel? My story, you know, it's not about me. Everything happens for a reason in my life. Everybody's like, oh, I wish I could go back in hindsight 2020. You wouldn't be who you are today 
if I didn't have, you know, so I always say I had to go through anyone's lessons, you know, every road, every pain to get here today. So um, I'm good with it. Uh, I've made peace with it. Um, once I got sober, you know, I tried to basically commit suicide with the drugs and alcohol I was doing before 40. So I'm good with my journey. Uh, my story is not about me. It's who might hear it, who might resonate with it, who might go, oh, somebody understands. Uh, for those who are just listening to the Athletes Podcast, you're not getting to see Brent's shirt that uh, displays big Dyslexia energy, and uh, it's uh, one of my favorites. I've seen you wear it on a couple different shows. Uh, I'm going to have to cop some of that merch as well. Uh, I also saw you were doing a $25 giveaway for your Stanley Cup dinner, which is amazing. Tell me about the Brent Sopel Foundation. Before we dive into your career, obviously this is something you want to enact change in. You want to change the world. I've heard you say that. Uh, let's make this happen here in the first five minutes. Yeah, you know, and that's what I call the documentary here to change the world because um, obviously being diagnosed at 32 and reading in a grade four level in high school, I never want a kid. That's why I started the foundation. I never want a kid to feel the way I do every day. So um, I'm an open book. I'm honest because I'm not the only one. It's the second most common thing in the world. Uh, and it's hereditary. So, you know, a lot of people, autism. I think autism is 1 in 40, 1 in 45 now. Not hereditary. Dyslexia is 1 in 5 and hereditary. So I'm trying to advocate for every dyslexic out there because going to school for 8 hours a day, it was awful. And you just, uh, you know, listeners, just think how many times a day you read. Try struggling with those. And the hard part is, I always called you're dumb, you're stupid, and you're lazy. And I think when I wake up every single day, I think I am dumb because I was told that so many years. No matter what I've accomplished, you know, I always say, you, you tell a girl in high school that she's fat every day, she's going to believe that. You know, that's trial to trauma. And I've got that. So, you know, I'm just trying to be here, advocate for every dyslexic. I understand you're not alone. Addiction, I've been in there. You know, 60 to 65% of us are addicted to drugs and alcohol. Suicide, been there. 89% of suicide notes left have dyslexic traits. So my story is definitely not about me. It's who might resonate with it, and you're not alone. I just had to give you some space there because it's also the passion that you speak with that I think people need to hear and see that you know now after your career, despite all odds, being able to see success. Let's start WHL Swift Current born Calgary. Let's start maybe having some fun here. I'm sure you got some crazy WHL stories. I just spent the week, two weeks ago up at the Kelowna hockey performance um, at Kelowna Hockey Fest and Brent Seabrook, who was yeah. someone who mentioned your name after a, I saw a Zoom call when I was doing this research and he talked about the fact that Soaps was black and blue after every game. And he's someone who deserved a shout out. And I wish I had done this research prior when I was talking to Brent a week ago in Kelowna because, man, what you went through during your career saying that you played half or three quarters of your games injured, you know, you wouldn't have known that watching as a kid playing when you were playing for the Canucks. You had a broken hand with the Habs, that hook cast, played a game <laughs> during that. Your whole season in L.A., you had a cast on. Like, how were you able to... Were you on the Russian gas? What were you? What was keeping you alive during those two moments? And I guess it was the drive. I guess this is part of your story, right? Well, you know, it's, to be honest, it wasn't the drive. It was the fear. The fear of the real world. When you struggle with the simplest things, you know, so we'll go back to, I've got the 40s, so ADHD, dyslexia, dysgraphia, which is the writing portion, and decalculia, which is the math portion. So anything school, I struggle. So the fear of my career ending is what drove me. There was no pain playing the game that was significant enough than the thought of the game, my career ending, if that makes sense. You know, I didn't care what that injury was. I didn't care what I had to do. I didn't care what puck, because that was nowhere near the pain of the thought of my career being over and having to enter the real world with no, you know, obviously learning journeys, no education, no work experience. Um, what was I going to do? So it was, it was a driving passion, but it was more the fear. When you look back at what you've been able to accomplish despite all of these things, and now you're trying to help that next generation, I feel a similar way 
you know, our goal is to educate, entertain, and inspire that next gen here on the Athletes Podcast. And I think some people have a better way of doing it through their written word, through their vocabulary, through in-person events. Some people are able to read better. I think one of the superpowers about individuals who have dyslexia, ADHD, is the fact that they're able to adapt to different situations, maybe not in an ideal way. Uh, I have family members who I'm dealing with this on a daily basis, and it's probably a learning experience for you when you had your daughter diagnosed, and that was really ultimately what led to you being diagnosed as well, right? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I got her tested when she was in grade two, but now she's at the senior in college. Um, I had no idea, you know, growing up in you know Saskatchewan, nobody talked about dyslexia, you know, and go back, you know, back there, mental health, nobody knew what ADHD is, no, you know, autism, that wasn't around back then. So people are like, oh, are you upset that it wasn't? No, I, you know, I want to change the next generation. So that's why I'm speaking out. And I didn't even know what the word was, I'm like dyslexia, what is that? So I dove in there to get the understanding to take care of my daughter. I didn't care about me. I was just focused on her. And if, thank God, if it wasn't for her, I still would be, you know, I think I'm dumb every day, but it would have been to a whole new level. Like, I would have been, I would have killed myself a long time ago if it wasn't for that diagnosis, 100%. You know, I've looked at it. I've sat in front of the train time and time again. I've done more drugs. I've done it all, you know, because when you, you know you're different. And you just mentioned something. Everybody learns, everybody learns differently. And I always refer back to, like, the love languages. There's five love languages. Your love language, probably not the same as mine. But that's okay. It's understanding how you learn. You know, is is that by reading? Is that by visual? You know, for an example, for a hockey player, is that seeing the coach drawing the drawing it up on the board, or is it a guy who can sit on the bench and have the coach say, "Hey, you need to do this and this." You know, I always say, you know, you know, as a teacher, uh, Sam drove ten miles. I'm like, I got no idea where Sam is because I, you know, my brain, I can't do that. So, are you a visual learner? Are you an audio learner? You know. Are you, you know, so there's different ways to learn. And I think as, you know, it's your podcast, I think athletes don't know that. And I think in the generation of coaches, they don't know what that means either. Because um, everybody doesn't learn the same way. You said, you know, some guys you need to yell at on the bench. Some days you got to pull aside and do it quietly. Same thing. They don't learn the same way. So as, as humans here, as athletes, we have to le- know and learn how we learn the best, how we need to get that message from the coach. You mean maybe having your head coach and Mark Crawford telling you you'll never play a game in the NHL wasn't something that you needed? But hey, you also well, no. ended up playing like 400 games <laughs> under him, right? Like, but you know, it was funny. You, you funny mention that. That worked for me. Mm-hmm. You know, so, I, you know, as you talk to hockey players, I think I'm the only hockey player in the world that's never taken a pregame map. Yeah, I, I was going to bring it up at some point. <laughs> but now, so why? You know, I figured this out without even knowing what I had. The more tired I was going to the rink, so like my day was normal. You know, if we're in Anaheim, I go to Disneyland and guys are sleeping. I'm in Disneyland or I'm in the mall or I'm from home in Chicago or Vancouver, pick up the kids from school or go to the mall, get groceries. My day was normal. Go to the rink. So the more exhausted I was going to the rink, the less my dyslexia and my ADHD worked. Now I'll go back to McCrawford. When he got my wires to cross where I got so angry at him, I just played. I didn't think. Mm-hmm. So it was, you know, would that style work? No. It worked for me. Um, without, you know, again, uh, the old school coaching way worked for me because it allowed me to get so mad that I just played hockey instead of thinking and playing hockey. Because if you think you can't play, and that's what my problem was. And my dyslexia, my ADHD, you know, hyperfocus. Then I was horrendous. Like, I look like, you know, I should be playing a junior when I was playing in the NHL, you know, West Coast Express, when my brain started working. So I needed to find ways to shut my brain off. Was there anyone within the organization or that had, like, dealt with this prior that could tell or that had any kind of understanding of what you'd been with? Like, no one within the NHL, like I'm flabbergasted that this wasn't something that someone had come across in the past prior. Well, you know, and that's why I speak out, you know, in my mind, I think less than 20% of the world actually know what dyslexia is. So 
If I, if you and I are walking down the street here in Kelowna, if we stopped 20 people, about, you know, on the streets of Kelowna, great city, had so much fun there. Um, <laughs> if you said anything about dyslexia, the one thing everybody says, hey, it's just flipping your B's and D's. And that's about 5% of it. Like, I, if I need to read an email, I have to print, print it out. I can't retain it off there. Or mm-hmm. I can't retain a text message. Um, you hand me a business card. I can't take it. So basically, you guys are born with your left brain wired. You read with your left. Our careful, right, careful lumping me in. I got a little bit. Don't worry. We're, no, listen, uh, yeah, we're, it's, it's one in five, so I'm not lumping anybody. Yeah, yeah. yeah. As, so as dyslexic, we start reading with our right. So basically, as the information goes to the top, it gets jumbled. So that's the big misconception. So, you know, am I going to say bad organizations, bad coaches? No, not at all. I'm not going to say any of that. Because nobody understands that right now. Mm-hmm. It's still so new. That's why I talk about it. That's why I'm always trying to talk to anybody possibly can because there's not the awareness out there. Now, hopefully I can change this. And in 15 years, if we had this, you know, we had this conversation, it's a different conversation where organizations are more aware of what ADHD is, you know, that dopamine, what that all means. So, um, again, it's a different conversation 15 years down the road, but go back 20 years ago, nobody knew what that was. So no hard feelings. That's Mm -hmm. just, that was part of my journey. And I believe that, you know, hundred percent. My journey in NHL has allowed me to have these conversations with you. Hey, just in the middle of this episode, I wanted to come in, give a shout out to our sponsor, Perfect Sports Supplements. Use the code AP20 at checkout to save twenty percent. And while you're at it, wherever you're listening, Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcast, do me a huge favor, hit that subscribe button. If you want to go even one step further, rate, review, comment. Share this on your social media platforms. I will be sharing a few, giving away a couple of gifts, unique opportunities here as we lead up to the Toronto Marathon. I fly out in less than a week. I appreciate you folks tuning into this episode. Here's to the rest of it. Enjoy. Uh, I am feeling honored to be able to have these kind of conversations, right? Like I said, I've been doing this for five years. I grew up watching you play with guys like Matthias Ole and Brendan Morrison. Nice. Actually, funny story. I have a picture of me with Don Cherry, Ron McLean, and my brother, and we went into your guys' D room. Uh, I was probably, I don't even know, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Um, I was a little chunkier then, but was in awe, could, speechless, couldn't even talk. I like, I'm pretty sure Brendan Morrison came up and like, said hi to my dad and I, I couldn't even speak. So that might have been what spurred on this podcast. Who knows? Um, professor Adam Nichols, who I've had on the show in the past, he's a professor of psychology at the University of Hull, who's also dyslexic. And we talked about some of the challenges that athletes face. He'd be someone who I'd love to connect you with. He's yeah, a no, absolutely. A1 researcher over in the time. UK. Um, but one of the things that you also talked about, the no pregame knack, having people kind of spur you on, get those wires crossed for lack of a better term i've also heard you bring up the topic of playing guilty and the first time i heard this was zach ronaldo mentioned this to me in hamilton uh shout out to him and the junior b pelham panthers uh they've been crushing it he's been coaching for a couple years now down there but he brought up playing guilty and he said that some guys need to go out the night before and to have a couple drinks so that they play better the next game or the next day so it's, it goes back to understanding, you know, the anxiety. You're getting Ronaldo, t- tough guy, right? Tr- you know, you don't want to sit there, and, sit there and think, lay in your bed, sit in your stall all day, that knowing you've got to go out and fight. Mm-hmm. It, you know, it's a tough career. So it's, it's understanding yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, players nowadays under, understand themselves a lot more than they did. You know, um, they're out there, they're eating their carrot sticks and doing yoga. When we were out at the bars drinking, drinking and smoking darts, uh, you know, mm-hmm. a little bit different. Uh, at the Roxy? Oh, own that place. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Sean O'Brien, you know, he, he's, per, you know, he's the owner now, but uh, he took away from some of us. But it, it's the way the game was, you know, uh, drinking was, uh, camaraderie was like that. You know, the game nowadays is very, it's not as team oriented as it was. You know, it's mm-hmm. more individualized. So it, it was with the game that's uh, played guilty many times. Um, my career was, you know, had ups and downs, but uh, had some good times, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, when you have three herniated discs for 30 years, you probably have to suck back a couple just to be able to play through those games. Um, I used to say I'm icing, from, I'm icing from the inside out. 
but that's what kept me alive, and, but almost killed me too. So it's, I, I understand, and you know, I just, it's, you're sober. Right? Um, the real world's a scary place. Yeah. And the more you understand yourself, not, you know, the easier it will be. It's, it's still going to be hard, 100%, but it's a lot easier when you got some understanding. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm glad you bring that up because I try and highlight obviously the amazing benefits that professional athletes get and what comes with, you know, being world class at your sport, but I also want to showcase the fact that there's lows and uh, not every day is sunshine and rainbows and especially after you've been living this rock star life uh, lifestyle for 10, 20, 30 years, after that, how the heck are you dealing with real life to your point? You know, and that's, so I always like, you know, trying to, uh, you know, terms for anybody, you know, after you go to high school and if you go to college, you enter the real world, like, holy shit, this place is a scary place. I did that at 40. Mm -hmm. So I was told where to be and what to be and how to be for 40 years. You took that away from me. And what dyslexia is and what I didn't have was self-esteem. Only place I got my self-esteem was hockey. I wasn't good at reading. I wasn't good at anything else. That's why I spent the hours in it. That's why I did the crazy things so I could get my self-esteem. You took that away from me. And that's when I wanted to die. You know, um, I think the longest stretch, six months or six weeks, never out of bed, never left the house, was 100% alone. Um, like I, that, everybody sees the outside, but you know, Look at social media. Oh, so please suck. Like, we're human too. You know, we all put our pants on the same way. Women, you jump off the bed to get in your little lemons, but we're all human too. I cry, you know. Um, everybody thinks that we're not. We're, we're, you know, shopping at certain grocery stores. No, we're born the same way. You know, I could go, you know, into deep. We're, we're human too. Do we want to screw up? No. You know, there's many times, you know, I've gone home and, you know, look in the mirror and what am I doing and why am I here and why am I doing? So just as somebody thinks it's a job for us, mm -hmm. no matter if you worked at Royal Bank or Lululemon or Starbucks, it's a job. So is this. But try having a job where you have millions and millions of eyes on you. Every move you make is scrutinized. You know, that mental health uh, definitely could take a toll. Yeah, and you got guys like Peter Forsberg bodying you all day. Hey, frig. Guy was unbelievable. Joe. I chased his ass around. I could never catch him. He was uh, he was phenomenal. Uh, you know, he unfortunately the injuries caught up to him, but God, that guy was a tank. Yeah, I mean, like we we mentioned the West Coast Express. Um, Luke Gazdick, who I've had on the show a couple of times, talked about watching Todd Bertuzzi growing up and seeing how he was like the ideal power forward. What was it like practicing with him, watching him on the ice? Uh, Todd, you know, what, you know, obviously massive body, massive, but he had ridiculous hands. So you want to combine both those. He could hold you off with his strength, right? He could. And then if he's in tidy at hands. So, um, see, I had a problem. Santa Claus never brought me hands in my, you know, my stocking, you know, he, you know, Santa, Santa brought his, his hands. So, he, he was the ideal power forward because he had both, you know, um, that big body and um, playing that style then. And then you put him in tight, you know, he could go bar down each league. He could stick handle through it with speed. So uh, that's a that's a complete package that Santa never brought for me. <laughs> you got to play with some absolute legends in Vancouver those first couple of years you arrived. Can you share any stories like Messier, Naslin, Young Sedins? Like was Bure was was that that was early. Yeah, was I got early. I was <laughs> early uh I had a couple training camps, you know, with yeah. them or was lived in Vancouver a couple summers when I after I got drafted to skate with them. So you know, earlier in my career, you know, there it's different than now is I was told be seen and not heard. Mm. So a rookie just shut up and learn. And you know, so some mess and you know, Marcus Naslin and Yurke Lume, Kirk McCoy, like Trevor Linden, obviously yeah. Matthias Olin. The list goes on. All the Swedes. Um, I just kind of sat back and watched and and, and listened to uh, to their advice. I didn't say too much. And obviously, you, you talk about the Sedins. We were rookies together. Uh, just phenomenal human beings. You know, um, obviously, how they represent their country, represent their their name, but how they represent the Vancouver Canucks. Just just amazing humans. And um, 
just to sit back and be on the ice, you know, with the West Coast Express. And obviously, Brendan Morrison being a local guy and what he was doing on that line, and to to be able to get the puck. I didn't want the puck here. You guys have it. Take mm-hmm. off with it. So to be on the backside of it, you know, uh, Ed Jovanovsky, uh, when he played, uh, it, like the list goes on and on. The guys that I was with, and um, you know, it was it was part of my journey, part of my career. Um, elevated me to, to able to, to win the Stanley Cup. So every guy I played with in the NHL, I learned something from. They helped me elevate to, to, to win the Stanley Cup. And I think somebody said, uh, I'm one of 1,500. I think there's like 4,000 people who've ever won the Stanley Cup. A certain percentage have won it once, twice, three. You know, So, mm-hmm. again, it allows me to be here today and talk about the foundation and be here to advocate for for every person in mental health, every man for you know mental health addiction. Um, that's that's at the end of the day what my purpose in life is. Can't thank you enough for doing that. Um, I also want to highlight the fact that you've brought up that that despite what should be the most memorable moment in your life was also one of the darkest. Can you yeah. share more about that? Yeah, you know, Stanley Cup. I would say was the most amazingest, worst feeling of my life. Because I didn't understand myself, I didn't know my didn't know myself. I didn't connect it with any of my teammates. It took me forty six years to connect with a person because I didn't even understand myself. So, you know, as you ask your question, hey, you know, did you have a GM? Do you have a coach that, that could help you? They couldn't help me if I couldn't help myself. Mm-hmm. You know, so I won that Stanley Cup. Is obviously. You know, a Canadian kid won the Stanley Cup millions time on you know on the outdoor rink, but I stood there around my teammates, not connecting to one of them, and I can look back on how empty I was. Um, it, you know, so the fact that I did win it, that uh, we're able to have these conversations, um, is because I won that Stanley Cup and able to get in different places on you know and use my platform you know for good. But you know, um, and it was amazing, but sure, it was dark and empty. pretty legendary career despite all of these obstacles we'll call them because i think many people are faced with different obstacles but i think more than anything this was something that you had to deal with from day one right and uh i imagine when you talked about i've heard you reference like eating pucks the adam sandler just (laughs) wearing them in the batting cages was better than facing that real world yeah I guess once you came to terms with facing the real world, when hockey was over, what you had known for so long, was there anything in particular, a transitional moment? I know you had your parents and family, or you had your family come and take you out, give you a bit of a... Oh, I had an intervention, you know, through rehab. So, um, like I said, I was almost dead before 40, my drugs and alcohol was doing so. Um, if they didn't come across at the time, if I didn't mess up that, uh, guy's wedding at that time, um, I wouldn't be here today. So, um, obviously they, they saved my life, but I guess I had to get sober to understand all myself. And what I, when I talk to people is I had to go back and clean out my closets. Mm. You know, I had childhood trauma, but it, which when you struggle reading, so I had to go back, you know, I, I, as I'm describing is I had to clean up my closets, like from zero to five years old, that closet, you know, six to 10, that closet, 11 to 15, that closet. It's not how it goes, but, you know, I had to be okay with who I am. I had to be okay with this journey to be able to stay sober. You know, if not, you know, I love drugs. I love alcohol because I had I could escape from this feeling of not connecting and being misunderstood every single day. Uh, so, um, it was a grind. It was, it wasn't easy, but every day I got self reflects. Okay. You know, what did I do wrong in this situation? What did I do right in this situation? Was this me? Um, and obviously connecting, uh, with Juliet, who's you know, my host on my podcast and, and now my wife, you know, it took me 46 years to connect with my first two human beings. Now, if you, you know, your listeners want to, you know, kind of take a second and listen to that. It took me 46 years to connect with somebody. It's a long, long, long lonely life. Um, but I'm, I'm here today and um, happy and grateful for our conversation. As am I and uh, so many others. I was 
almost tearing up going through that YouTube video, watching, listening, reading some of those comments. I don't know if you've gone through that. If you haven't, uh, if you're ever feeling down, that's the place to go. Because I was like, man, this guy's touched so many people. And you, like, kudos to you. Um, and as a goalie, I can confirm that sometimes <laughs> you feel alone and people can't yeah. resonate with how you're feeling, you know? Uh, and I have no qualms about admitting that. And, you know, I've had days where it's like, man, what am I doing here? Even with this podcast, right? Like it's one a week for five years you just put in the reps and to your point, when you're growing up, you win the Stanley cup, how many times on that rink yeah. as a kid yeah. and it only happens once. And sometimes even if that moment might look amazing on the outside, it, you don't know how that person's feeling yeah. on the inside. And that's every, every single one of us, right? Yeah. You know, nobody, you know, we don't know. Everybody wants to judge a book by the cover. You don't know. Somebody cut me off. Well, he didn't wake up that morning and say, I'm going to find Brent and cut him off. You know, he's an asshole. That's not how this works. This world's a tough place. So let's not judge the book by the cover. You know, we all bleed red. And you and you never know. And did, did somebody have a bad day? Is somebody struggling financially? Is there divorce? Is there something happened? We don't know. So there's not enough love in this world. And before somebody can love you, you got to love yourself. And I've heard you talk about how coaching has also helped you. I felt that um, recently starting up coaching some high school basketball kids, some strength and conditioning, very basic level. But I've heard you reference the fact that coaching, you know, got you out of bed at night and yeah. continues to do that. 100%. You know, everybody, you know, when you're going through depression and anxiety, alcohol, you, you, you always think you're alone. You know, so first, you know, all your listeners, you're not alone. I'm here with you. So reach out if you ever need anything. But, so you got to have a purpose. Every one of us have to find that purpose. Is that to go, you know, to work with the high school basketball team? Is that to work with, you know, kids? Whatever that is, we need to find a purpose. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have a purpose. And I didn't want a purpose. The only purpose I wanted was death. Because I didn't love myself. You know, and still, you know, I always say, you look in the mirror and say, I love you, know it, feel and believe it. You know, I'm working on that every day. You know, mm -hmm. 47 years old, I still can't say that 100 percent. so working there but you know the kids the kids gave me purpose to, to come there and see that smile on their face and they got me out of bed and they got me going and um uh, messing around with them um has definitely got me they got me there i mean you know everybody has roller coaster in life life isn't what's is that tv show desperate housewives white pick fence that's not reality uh, Ryan Phillips, former guest on the show as well, someone who you're connected with. What's with hockey players having to deal with this? It seems like we take on, we're also like, I, I shouldn't say we, I, I'm loving You guys are able to withstand some absolutely insane conditions, both on and off the ice. What is it with hockey players that makes them a special breed? Do you know? Have you identified that, seeing so many guys over the years? Well, you know, um, Every athlete is wired differently yeah. to make it. You know, you take a look at golf or you take a look at football. You know, what we have to do to make it, um, we're, we're all wired differently. But I always say hockey's, you know, hockey's a little bit different because, you know, baseball, basketball, football, those sports, golf, you don't have to move away from home. Mm. Some of us move away home at 12, 13, 14, 15. Right? We grew up in a different way. We parent ourselves. So very different, you know, you go back to, um, you know, again, here, you know, here in the U.S., you know, college football is massive, obviously, just starting. Those guys don't, they graduate from high school. How many how many players, you know, in CHL graduate from home high school? Mm -hmm. um, not very many. So not a good we grow up, we have to parent ourselves. We grow up in a faster way and a different way than, than most of the world. Is there any supplementation that you can do for dyslexia? I, I've heard like kefir with ADHD can be beneficial, like in the gut microbiome. Like I'm sure you've done more. Yeah. I think of a guy like Daniel Carcillo with what he's doing. Like, is there people that are out there doing research, learning about ways we can mitigate it? You know, first off, you can't mi mitigate something you don't understand. Hmm. So that's the first and foremost, most in understanding that. And uh, you know, obviously 40% of dyslexics have ADHD. So it's understanding, and no matter what that is, no matter what it is, it's alcohol, you know, depression, you know, 
you're chasing it till you understand it. Mm-hmm. And the first and foremost thing is obviously it is the diagnosis. You know, you get diagnosed earlier, just kind of like cancer. You want to find out stage one rather than stage four. So, you know, again, I always say, and then, you know, my purpose is I've got to educate everybody what it is before I can advocate change. So it's, it's understand that I think, you know, that is the biggest thing is understanding and understanding what comes with it. And because everybody's different, every human's different. It's, you break a wrist out oh, your four to six weeks. There's a reason why they say four to six weeks because every person is different. Mm-hmm. Uh, time over in Russia. Anything in particular that comes to mind when I bring that up other than the gas? I love it. Yeah. You know, again, I made some great friends um, in and out in like 10, 11, 12 different countries, but it, it allowed me to continue my career. It allowed me to c- keep playing the thing where I got my self esteem. Yo, know, there, I was treated great. Um, met some amazing people, friends I'm still friends with, but. You know, obviously, I, I was able to make, you know, a thousand regular season games pro. Mm-hmm. But it was part of my journey uh, to get here. The Russian gas was raised. And, you know, I can, you know, I can go into many scenarios. I was actually, when the local motor plane went down, and I was living in uh, there. I was over there. I was in, actually sitting in the Moscow airport. So, um, but it allowed me, for me, to continue playing and continue searching and receiving uh, self-esteem, which, you know, once that ended, it, it took me down quickly. You were a victim of this salary cap casualty, we'll call it, uh, in like 04, 05, yeah. um, put up some good numbers and then, you know, just was, that was a fact of the matter. Um, what was the consensus like around the league when that came in? Like, I'm sure you weren't the only guy that it impacted and like, is it, I guess I'm curious back if you were to rewind take me back 20 years but that was like yeah i know it sucked you know obviously not playing for for a whole year and um again the biggest thing what everybody has to remember it's a bit it was a business mm-hmm. you know hockey is there we're entertainers it's not a sport you know did it suck 100 percent? did it screw me 100 percent? a couple million you know, bucks yeah and um it cost me, you know, obviously short in my career. Um, I, th- I, you know, I think after that lockout, there was, I, if I remember correctly, like 350 players never played another game. That forced them into retirement. So that, but that was the difference between now I find and and then today. Mm-hmm. We sacrificed for the better of the game, right? Did I want salary cap to come in? Absolutely not. But we tried to get other things to, to make the be- game better. You know, um, to make the union stronger, so we kind of took a kick in the nuts for the guys now to sign fourteen million dollar contracts as of today, this I, morning. I, that may be the dumbest thing I've. You know, and I have a hard time sitting here listening to him, to Steven Stamkos, talk about you know their teams. You just want to sign Max. How are you for your team, Steven Stamkos? You were all you wanted to be a Tampa Bay. No, you didn't, because they are. You know, I don't obviously rumors we can't say, but if you cared about the Tampa Bay that Lightning that much, you would have signed this six years, three million dollars. That's dedication. You know, Leon Drysaddle. You want to win? You you don't win now because you just signed for fourteen million dollars. That's the difference between the game now. So so Stan, you know, everybody's talking about. Um, you know, the Stamkos you know, situation. If you cared, you made enough money, but you wanted more money. You were yeah. more important than the Tampa Bay Lightning. Leon Dreisaitl, you were more important because the salary cap, you know, as you just said and referred to, that only goes up so much. You can only fit. And you win in Stanley Cups with your third and fourth line and your four, five, six, seven demon. And you just eliminate, you know, those guys just eliminated that. Uh, and don't tell me you're for the team. You were the furthest thing for the team. I think of like a Dave Boland and, and and like even a guy like you in 2010, like you don't win those that cup if you don't have elite guys rounding out your core. And, Everybody's uh, got a first line. Everybody's like, you know, your top teams have the first line and second line. Yeah. But, you know, do you have that depth? And 
obviously our third line could have been some team's second and first line. We had yeah. that depth. So you go third line to third line, we're winning. Fourth line to fourth line, we're winning. That's why we won the Stanley Cup. I think of Crosby taking a pay cut, McKinnon taking a pay cut. Mike. Hundred percent. You know, yes, you can make Leon Dreisaitl. You know, if you took ten million, yes, is it a lot of money? Hundred percent, big money. But you still have made sixty million dollars. So you tell me, if you want winning, what's more important, winning the Stanley Cup or having that extra ten million dollars in bank account? You just told me. And the argument that I would also add to that is, okay, give up four million per year for those eight years. Ensure you're giving up a bit of cash. But imagine the amount of money you could make from endorsement deals, from brands, from sponsorships. If you won two, three, four Stanley Cups with Connor McDavid by your side, putting up 100 plus points, 30 plus power play points, like imagine a world. Whereas now you're scrutinized because you have a $14 million contract and you've got two guys who are going to now be making $30 million on your payroll. And how the heck are you supposed to support a team with 23 other guys? Look at the Toronto Maple Leafs. It, it physically can't work that. So now, Leon, you want to be the highest paid, so you just one up. So what, Connor, he's going to one up you. you know, he's already, I think, 12 and a half. So that jump from 12 and a half to, say, 15 or 3 million doesn't matter. He, went, he doubles the salary. So now you can take away... Yo, I think the difference is, you know, like, you know, Evander Kane, you know, he's making yeah. 5 million. So you eliminate a fi- Evander Kane who, who can slide. I think, he, you know, he obviously was first a, to know, third line anywhere, anywhere. Yeah. Um, yeah, he you clearly want. wasn't healthy. And, um, again, um, you know, clearly wasn't healthy, but now you might have to remove him from that team moving forward, which, you know, again, the year before he put up, you know, how many goals that's, you just changed your whole team. And like you just said, Sidney Crosby, so now I'm going to see, you know, 8.7 for how many years? He, he was a tall million-dollar player all these years. That's, mm-hmm. being, that's a guy who cares about his team. And it's actually crazy because the Lightning were basically put together as a team of a bunch of former captains. I don't know if you've seen all – like they were sniping for – I think that was probably during the um, – uh, whatever whatever era it was that uh, uh, Stevie Y was pulling in yeah. for the uh, for the Lightning, and it was like they had 15 captains, 15 or 16 previous captains on their team of 25 rostered guys because they knew if you've got leaders on your roster, you're going to win games. So it's shocking that I guess at a certain point you got to cut your losses, but I agree with you. I am a well, huge advocate you know, for loyalty. You know, Hedman's been with the best team for years. Yeah. What, was he make, what was he making? Yeah, it's true. He took a pay cut, right? Vasilevsky, you know, you know, and everybody can talk about, pay, you know, um, no state tax and, and that kind of stuff. But, you know, it's, you went and took $8 million in Nashville instead of staying in Tampa where you've been all these years. You could have been retired as a Tampa Bay Lightning. You won two cups. You were a hero in playing those three minutes. What is it? And what year that was? Night eighteen or whatever that was when he scored. You know, you you had a legendary career set up. Mm-hmm. Now you took it off that legendary in my mind for money. Doesn't happen often that uh, athletes stick with the same team throughout the entire career. Like I think of a Dirk Nowitzki, uh, Kobe Bryant. Like you know, in the NHL. It doesn't happen often at all nowadays, right? But few and far between. And I think it's, again, part because you mentioned it well, earlier, it's a business. And, you know, in, in the salary cap era has has done that. Yeah. Right. So I, I think that might be, uh, you, asked, you asked that question a little bit earlier, so kind of backtrack. I want, you know, I think you probably, that's probably the biggest portion of it is that players cannot stay in that, you know, or don't stay with their teams very often, you know, obviously Chicago, Patrick Kane, right? There's very yeah. few now because that salary cap limits him to what you do. I came in the rear, there's no salary cap. And New York Rangers are going to sign whoever. And it didn't matter. But now I think it makes it very, very hard. And it's going to be moving forward very, very rare that somebody stays with that team their whole career. Was that a – did? It- I was watching that Netflix documentary about Joe Sackett getting offer sheeted by the Rangers. Like, what went down? That there's got to be some D room chats from that. You know, again, you take a look at um, 
the salary cap era, right? You know, there's there's always circumventing. There's always way. You obviously, talk about Tampa Bay always circumventing the cap. Mm-hmm. No, Vegas, they're yeah. smart, mm-hmm. thinking outside the box, thinking different ways. Vegas, right? You know, you know, it's um, you know, obviously Edmonton. You know, with those two offer sheets. You know, St. Louis. Yeah, it's you know, it's it's a business, and you have to you you have to tack it. You know, you take a look at you know Fortune 500 company buying somebody else. Or mm-hmm. Amazon buying somebody else. That's what it was. You know, they, you know, there was no limitations. They had the, they had the money, and um, they forced, you know, they forced their hand, and that's the business side of things. That uh, I remember those, you know, I remember those days. Uh, the well, we were still getting paid Canadian dollars, and then we go to the U.S. <laughs> and lose thirty percent. It was awesome. <laughs> yeah, that, that's tough. I I feel that pain now. Um, you know, 2010, 2011 with the Habs price. Top goalie you ever played against was was if he wasn't who was? Again, I played some amazing players against Patrick Waugh and, and Marty Berdera. And you uh, grew up emulating him in your basement, oh, yeah. You know, yeah. Um, for a while, we had a, a basement that wasn't finished, so I'd stand on one side of the basement with a hockey stick and a golf ball and a baseball glove, and I'd take a slap shot at the concrete, stick my stick over, and a glove save, you know. Not coming back, you know, whatever it was, no equipment on. Uh, I do that for hours, but uh, Terry Price, a phenomenal human being, phenomenal goalie. Um, you know, the wear and tear on the body, and when you rely on somebody heavily, like you know, like the Montreal Canadiens did for for years and years, it's it's a team game. And I think that what is very different from the other sports, you don't win with one superstar. Mm. You got to have everybody pulling on the same rope and. You know, Carey Price was counted on, you know, too much time and time again. And that body, you know, again, we all have bodies. You know, at some point, then start breaking down. Favorite place to play that uh, hockey brought you over the years? Favorite arena, city? You know, probably have to say, you know, in New York, MSG. Just, yeah. you know, the history that comes by it. Obviously, uh, you know, Montreal stands there. Um you know, I miss, I just missed all the old barns, you know, the form and Maple Leaf Garden and, you know, um, so the newer bu- buildings, uh, don't bring what they used to, but, you know, I have to say, you know, obviously MSG, uh, mm-hmm. walking up the ramp or, uh, obviously Molson Center. And then Vancouver during playoff time. Dude, that building was rocking. You know, I missed GM Place and it was, it was that, you know, that song, you know, the whiteouts. Um, oh, yeah. No memories that, you know, uh, I'll never forget. Grateful for all my time in Vancouver. You know, my youngest daughter was born there. who's now uh, second year in college. Um, loved my time there. Fans loved me. The fans hated me. But uh, I'll never forget my time there. Hey, I know one fan for sure. Actually, there was four of us here in the Stark household that, that were all fans of Brent Sopel. So, hey, uh, I want to thank you for coming on the show, man. This has been great. Uh, it's an honor to chat with you. I'm uh, grateful that... I am able to provide this platform to share your story. I know it's going to impact so many, even if it's just one person. Uh, everyone listening knows that uh, both Brent and I are here with you. And hey, I always leave a bit of space here at the end for people to share their biggest piece of advice to the next generation of athletes, whether that's a quote, whether that's a book, whether you want to simply say that you're here today to help someone, whatever that is. Um, I want to give you that sprint space and, um, say thank you again for coming on the show man yeah no i appreciate you it's there's only one thing you control control is yourself you can't control your coach you can't control your mom your sister your girlfriend so make sure you look at yourself first in the mirror before you you start projecting out wise words brent sopo thank you so much for coming on the show appreciate Thanks your time. For having me. i want to say thank you again to brent for coming on the show thanks to perfect sports our sponsor for continuously providing us with the number one protein on the market, as well as keeping us hydrated with Hydro Splash, Creatine, Glutamine, all your essential supplements. For you folks, make sure to use the code AP20 to save 20% at checkout at perfectsports.com. You might as well because it's the best stuff on the market and you might as well be doing the best you possibly can to perform your best. That includes hitting protein goals. Thank you folks for tuning in. I hope you have a great rest of your day. We'll see you next week for another new episode. Bye.